Um, so today I'll be telling you a bit about our efforts uh, to optimize uh, room temperature single photon sources. Um, so first of all, the, the basic issue with the, what we want to do with room temperature sources is we, well, we imagine that it's more compact, more scalable, and less demanding in terms of the equipment needed in order for a single photon source to operate. So this is kind of our vision um, uh, in, in trying to develop these sources. Now, obviously, as many of you already know, there's already many sources uh, available that actually operate at room temperature. Uh, such sources include, for example, nanocrystal quantum dots, which are fabricated colloidally, uh, using colloidal chemistry, sorry. So they're relatively easy to fabricate. You can actually tune their spectrum by just changing the size, which is nice. And because they're standalone objects, you can easily integrate them to any photonic um, circuit you, you want. Um, another class of such sources includes defects in crystals, for example, NV centers and certain vacancies in diamond, but there's also a, a whole host of defects in 2D materials and in carbon nanotubes and 1D materials and so on and so forth. However, trying to work at room temperature comes with some intrinsic challenges that you have to overcome. One issue is isotropic emission. So this is actually also uh, true for cryogenic sources. So these sources tend to emit in all directions at all angles, and you can only collect within some sort of NA, some NA of your optics. Um, and the question is, how can we improve that? So that, that's one issue. The other issue that is that the, at the rates that we require for future quantum technologies, the lifetimes are way too slow. So these, they have lifetimes on the order of tens to hundreds of nanoseconds, which make them very slow for, for useful applications. And finally, they have very broadband emission. These room temperature sources tend to have uh, spectral widths of about tens to hundreds of nan nanometers. So if we combine these two th three things together, you end up with very low useful brightness from these sources, which make them very unappealing. And what I'm trying to tell you about today is how can we overcome these issues and make them actually useful um, for applications. So just to be concrete, when we say brightness, we mean how many photons per second you can get out of this device. And usually you need something like 10 to the nine photons per second for useful quantum application. Um, and this brightness depends on many factors, but there's two main factors that it, it depends on. The first one is the collection efficiency, which is what we talked about before. So you have a source that's emitting isotropically, you can only collect a certain fraction of these photons. So we improve, you can improve that in principle by placing your emitter into some sort of antenna that will redirect the emission into a narrower, a narrower angle uh, region so you can collect more of the photons. The other main factor is the, is the decay rate. So you can only, the lifetime of the emitter limits you as to how fast you can uh, excite the, the emitter and how fast the emitter can emit. So the faster the decay rate, the more photons you can get out of the source. Now the intrinsic decay rates, as we said before, limited to something like tens to hundreds of nanoseconds. So you can improve that by inducing a Purcell factor, placing your emitter into some sort of resonator that will increase uh, its decay rate. Now, the issue um, at room temperature, as I'll show you in a minute, is that you cannot achieve both of these, uh, do improve both of these in one, one structure. And this is what I'll, I'll try to convince you of in, in, in the next slide. So what I, what I show you here, uh, this is the Purcell factor as a function of the quality factor of your structure and as a function of the mode volume. And it's just this relation here. So the Purcell factor is directly proportional to the quality factor and inversely proportional to the mode volume. So this is just a standard textbook uh, formula for the Purcell factor. On the other hand, if you want to look at directionality, just from the basic Fourier relation between real space and case space, so real space and angular space, the larger your mode volume is, the more uh, less angular dispersion you can get. So you want to be in the large mode volume sort of area in order to get higher directionality. Um, on top, I also show the cool uh, line widths of some, some emitters. So you have your NV centers, colloidal quantum dots, silicon vacancies, and these are cr for cryogenic sources. I just chose self-assembled quantum dots, uh, which are very famous. Now, so there are several regions here which are very, very of great interest. The first region of interest would be um, this top right corner. 
which belongs to the sort of the area of dielectric resonators. So here you have high quality factors in large mode volumes. So structures like these include micropillar cavities and uh, photonic crystal cavities. And because of the large mode volume, you can get very high directionalities. And because of the high quality factors, you can get hypercell factors in the same structure. However, this high quality factor induces a very narrow bandwidth of, of, of the cavity itself. And this bandwidth, which you can see here actually, uh, is very restrictive for room temperature sources. So you're basically um, sort of compelled to use it only for cryogenic operation or else you would have very low efficiency. So once we, we figure this out, we know that if we want to operate at room temperature, we need to use very low quality factor structures. And in that sense, you have to choose between one of two regions. So either you operate in this plasmonic resonator region or in this sort of antenna region. So these plasmonic resonators, oh, both of these have broadband operation because of this low, mode, low quality factor. But if you, you can either choose high directionality where, where the large, when you have a large mode volume or a high per cell factor where you have um, a low mode, uh, small mode volume, okay? And because of the small mode volume for plasmatic resonators, you need to actually be able to precisely position the emitter with respect to the, to the, to the mode of the structure. Okay, so this imposes a real challenge in terms of do because you, you would want to improve both of these. So what is our solution? Our solution is basically very simple. Just take two structures, one from here and one from here, and combine them together in a single structure. So you have this an bullseye antenna I'll talk a bit more about in a while, and on the center, which belongs to this region, and in the center we place this nanocone antenna, a nanocone resonator, which belongs to this region here. So the nanocone actually induces a hypercell factor, the antenna gives you high directionality. And just to give you the end of the story from now, the, the whole idea is that we, we, we were able to experimentally demonstrate that we can re approximately reach rates of about 10 to the eight photons per second using this combined structure, which is something very interesting. And this is all at room temperature again. So how do we do that? So the way I'll organize the talk now is I'll tell you first just about the antenna by itself without the nanocone, and then we'll bring the nanocone back into the picture. So the antenna we use, um, is this hybrid, what's known as this hybrid metal dielectric bullseye antenna. So it consists of a, a, a set of metallic concentric rings um, on top of which is a dielectric layer. This dielectric layer acts as a waveguide layer. So basically when you have, when you uh, excite the, and you, you place the emitter, whatever it is, the quantum dot or whatever, at the center here in, at some height inside the waveguide. And what happens is when you excite this, the emitter per, emits eventually into this dielectric layer. So it goes radially outward, encounters these rings on the way, which diffract the beam. And we design the structure in such a way, and we optimize it using simulations, in such a way that the interference between all of these diffracted beams occurs only at very low angles. Okay? And one essential feature of this antenna is it's very broadband, as I mentioned before. So to show this, what, I, what I'm showing you here are simulations of the collection efficiency as a function of wavelength for um, a structure that's optimized at 650 nanometers. So you can see, and this is shown for different NAs. So you can see already that, that the device is actually quite broadband in the structure. And the NAs actually are not uh, randomly chosen. These are NAs of, of optical fibers. And the reason we do this is because we imagine eventually that because of these high collection efficiencies, we can just butt couple a fiber to our antenna without any additional optics, which is kind of where this project is going. Okay, so uh, I'll spare you the fabrication details and I'll just go jump right to, into the experimental results. Um, so we, we managed to fabricate these antennas in a very nice way and, and position single colloidal quantum dots in the center of these. And this is what's shown in this image here. So and this microscope image is, uh, you're just looking at the top with white light and you're, you're imaging your sample. So this is the, the antenna on the top. And on the right here, you see the fluorescent image in real space, how it looks like. Okay, so you can see actually that the emission is actually coming from the center of the, the bullseye. So we managed to uh, put our quantum dot in the right place. 
We confirmed that it's a single quantum dot by doing G2 measurements uh, using a Hanbury Brown twist experiment. And this lack of a peak at the center indicates that you have very high single photon purity. Now, the essential feature of this antenna is its directivity. So we need to show that we can, it actually has high directionality. And in order to do that, we do Fourier plane imaging technique. So we, we image the back focal plane of our objective and get um, an image showing us the angular uh, pattern of our structure. So uh, this is this uh, case space image you see here. Um, so for example, this, uh, this radial direction now is actually angles from the normal to the surface. So for example, if you're raised here, it would have uh, an angle of 30 degrees from the normal, okay? As you can see from the image that most of the emission is coming at zero degrees to the surface, to the normal. So it's all coming normal to the surface going outward. So this proves that the antenna is actually operating as it's supposed to do. Now, one critical, one critical aspect is that this is consistent over many devices. This is not a single hero experiment. We've done it over many, many devices and we get similar results. Now, if we integrate this image, what we get eventually is the collection efficiency. What is the percentage of photons that you can collect into any given NA? Um, and this is what I'm showing you here. So the orange is the experimental curve. The purple is what we expect from simulations. And you can see we get very high collection efficiencies. For example, at an NA of 0.5, you get a collection efficiency of over 80%, which is quite high. And we also compare this to current literature, what, what's out there, what people already measured uh, in terms of collection efficiency. And we see that our, perform, our device is actually performing very well compared to li literature. One essential thing to, know, to note here is that um, these, the, most of these devices are actually for, for devices operating at cryogenic temperatures. Due to the broadband emission of our structure, even at the broadband emission of our structure, we can get very high collection efficiency. So this is something very impressive. Uh, just as a side note, we also uh, managed to do this using nano diamonds. So we have that, uh, nano diamonds with single NVs and we placed them as center of the bullseye again, showed again, you know, that they're single NV centers and very high directionality also using the sim same similar techniques. So what I've shown you till now is the fact that uh, we can get very significant enhancement in directivity with, uh, but with no rate enhancement whatsoever. So how do we get the rate enhancement? We have to bring back this nanocone into the picture. So now we bring back this nanocone. And the reason why we chose this nanocone is because, well, first it has a very large field enhancement near the tip due to the lightning rod effect. Uh, but secondly, we have a very nice method of binding quantum dots selectively to the nanocone tip, okay? So this is just an SEM image of the device. Uh, shown and when simulations we show, we show that we can achieve both this high, very high collection efficiency while, while also getting a hyper cell factor. So what you see here again is this uh, microscope image and a fluorescent, this is actually a confocal fluorescence image um, showing that there's only emission from the center uh, of the device indicating that we've selectively bound these quantum dots actually only to the nanocone and nowhere else. Again, we do G2 measurements to confirm that it's a single QD. And now we need to show that actually the lifetime is reduced and the, the collection efficiency is maintained. So to do that, first we measure the quantum dots on glass. So we measure a lifetime of about 20 nanoseconds on glass. Um, and then com compare this to a measurement on our device where we measure a lifetime of about one nanosecond. So this tells us that we actually successfully induced the Purcell factor of about 20, which is very nice. And this is also while maintaining uh, a high collection efficiency compared to that on glass, similar to what we saw, we saw before. So these two factors coming together tell us that we achieved significant brightness enhancement. And to quantify that, um, we show sort of this brightness enhancement factor. So at the beginning, at the beginning um, I told you that the brightness is sort of the rate, the decay rate times the collection efficiency. Uh, so the brightness enhancement would be the improvement in the decay rate, which is just the Purcell factor, times the improvement in the collection efficiency. And this is what I'm showing you here. So this is the brightness enhancement factor as a function of numerical aperture. And as you can see... Sorry, this was your chime letting you know that the time was over. Really? It was 15 minutes already? Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, I'm finishing. This is the last slide. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the brightness enhancement is above 
thousand for low NAs, but even for an NA of, of 0 0.5, we got uh, an enhancement of over 80 times that, um, 80 times the what you would get on glass. Okay, so I hopefully I, I uh, have convinced you that we've been able to successfully at least improve one aspect of room temperature sources, which is brightness. And if we take this lifetime and project what we would get, we would achieve something like 10 to the 8 photons per second using it. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention in this talk was uh, how we can improve the purity of these sources, single photon purity of these sources, but this is something um, that we published in this paper and I'm more than willing to talk about this. We also have some work now going on on plug and play, trying to make this plug and play, but um, I will spare it since there's no time now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for listening. All right. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I liked it a lot. And uh, now we can also applaud the speaker. So let's give it a try. Everyone should be open a microphone. Thank <laughs> you.